Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. the epistle of joy. Thank you, Pastor Guy, for filling in. Or not filling in, but being here. Heard it was great. So in chapter 4 of the Philippians, he's going to wrap this little letter up that he wrote. So let's read these first seven verses. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, remember this is Paul, he's writing this letter, Paul, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Eudia, I think, and Syntech to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion. I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement, also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. That's a great verse right there, isn't it? It's a good song. It's a good song. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, this is your word and we pray, Lord, you will minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So he starts off here, you know, in this therefore, you know, therefore is one of those whatever... It, because of all these other things, therefore now, he says, my beloved brethren whom I long to see, my joy, my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord. He's telling us, do not waver. Stand firm. Trust in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. Because He will be with you. He will be with you for life and throughout eternity. Don't waver. Walk with the Lord. You know, he's reminded him. You know, stand firm. Don't be wish-washy. Don't, don't let the things of the world tear you down. Joy, joy, joy. You know, this book's just full of joy. But, you know, I guess they have a little problem with church. Now, you have to remember that, you know, when he wrote this letter to this church, he wrote it to the church. And they probably, as a body of believers, when they gathered together, read it out loud to everyone. And so he says here in verse 2, he says, I urge Udia, and I urge Syntax to live in harmony in the Lord. They must. They were probably there. And he's, it must have been something that they were really dealing with in the church that he actually named them and said, "Live in harmony. Live in harmony in the Lord." There was a problem, obviously, with these two women in the church. It's, it's uh, you know, women in this this church in the, in Philippi. They played a huge part in starting this church. You remember in, in early on when, in Acts, the first convert was the Greek woman Lydia. And then the slave girl that was demon possessed and got delivered and they ministered to her. She got saved and they were part of this church starting. So they played a big part. And now, you know, they're having some problem here. In verse 3 it says, Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. Together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. These women seem to be very strong believers. It wasn't like, you know, a couple of new believers. They would seem to be, you know, they, they had been with Paul. They worked with Paul. You know, they share with him in the struggles of the gospel and the trials of, you know, being in a church, being a believer in, in a place maybe didn't receive it so well. So they really knew the Lord, but, you know, they, they were having some kind of problems here. Now, he says there, to help, you know, in the King James, the word is labor. Labor, the term is labor there. And he's talking about them 
to be warriors together in this, to live in harmony and to be <coughs> warriors together. Now, we don't know what the issue is there, but we know that in these verses 2 through 7, Paul's given us different ways to work things out. He's given us a few things. And number one is, strive for unity in the body. He says that in verse 2 when he says to the two ladies, to live in harmony in the Lord. I urge you to live in harmony. I beg you, live in harmony. Get along. Like I said, this issue is so big, he put the letter, he wrote it to the whole church. Put them on the spot, I would imagine. I mean, obviously everybody knew about it, and he put them on the spot. I urge you to get along. It's interesting, it's not about who is right or wrong, but it's that act of submission to the Lord to get along with each other. Right or wrong. You know what? Submit to the Lord and get along. The issue isn't about right or wrong. Christian conduct, I wrote here, is not about being right or, or keeping bitterness, but is about being an instrument of His love. Being a peacemaker. In Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You know, and that is a word to us. Be kind to one another. Not be backbiting, not gossiping about one another, tearing one another apart. Being good to one another. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 7 and 8. Actually, then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. Why don't you take your brother to court? Can't you guys work it out together? Wouldn't it be better to be wrong rather than mess up the testimony of Jesus as Christians are fighting? You know, the Bible says, that they will know we are Christians by the love we have for one another and we're mad at each other, fighting and arguing and tearing apart you know, our different churches and different people. They don't see love. They don't see the church. They don't see Christ in that. So why not just rather be wrong and causing division in the church and a bad witness? That's hard, I know. You know, I don't just throw that out there and say, you know, I can have it done, you guys. I mean... You wrong me, and I'm looking at smile real big. Go, hee. You know, sometimes I might do that. But sometimes, you know, I have to deal with it first. And I may have to come back later and apologize for my attitude after I fried you. <laughs> Some of you probably know that. So, and then in verse three, he's talking about their indeed the true companion. You know, he's talking about people that are yoked together, a true companion, people that are like-minded. You know, co-laborers. Working together. Assist one another. Come together with them. Help them. Don't just talk about them. They're, all, they're fighting again. Help them. Work through whatever. Just be a peacemaker with that problem or, the, or people not getting along. See if you can do that. You know, Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, 1, 1 through 3 said, Therefore I the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, with which you have been called, with humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Go for it. Strive for it. I've got peace like a river. That's why the Lord popped that song in my head. And it was in today's scripture. And the kids love it. Strive for it. Work at it. How do you work at peace? Well, you can work at it on your knees. The Lord help. Give me the right heart. Make me gentle. Keep me humble. That's a, that's a great place. Do all you can to be a peacemaker. God loves peacemakers. There's a blessing about that. So number one, strive for unity in the 
body of Christ. Yes, he's talking to them, but he's talking to us. Number two, God's prescription for peace is verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. No matter what, rejoice. Always. You have to remember, Paul is writing this from prison. Rejoice and always. Did that mean he was rejoicing in prison? Yeah, he rejoiced in prison. We know the stories of Paul. You know, I mean, he didn't even, he didn't even split one time. He really stayed in. You know, and, and rejoiced. You know, that the Lord had plans. The Lord wanted to do things. So no matter what, rejoice. You know what? You might not be able to rejoice in your circumstances, but you can rejoice in the Lord. Oh, you know, it's not like, oh boy, this is fun. I'm glad this is happening to me. You know, I'm glad my mother just passed away. Yeah, right. It doesn't work that way. But you can rejoice in the Lord, knowing that He's with you. Knowing that you're saved. Knowing that He's going to work it out for good for all those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. You can rejoice. You can find something to rejoice. Lord, I'm still breathing. You know mine. You probably guys, I've told you guys mine so much. I always rejoice. I'm still going to heaven. No matter what happens, I'm laying in the hospital bed paralyzed going, I'm still going to heaven. Maybe sooner than I thought at that time. He promises that He will always be with us. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in the fact that He will work it out for good. Rejoice that you will end up in heaven. Rejoice in the Lord. You know, just do it. Try it. I know it, you know, when, it, when it's bad and when it's hard, sometimes it's really, really hard. But you know what? Just make yourself do it. It's like a sacrifice of praise. It's you know, there's been many times, you know, I was a worship pastor for years in my home church. And there were times I came in the worship leader and didn't want to worship. I didn't really want to sing. You know, I was like, you know, when something was bad, it was like my heart was just not there. It's like, why am I even in church? Why am I here? But I, you know what? I had a calling. I had something I needed to do. And I understood that. And I would make a sacrifice of praise way past my feelings. I'll tell you what, I can never remember one time when that happened that after I started doing that, my heart didn't change and I was filled with peace and joy. Every time, no matter what had happened, the peace and joy of the Lord filled my heart when I did that. Rejoice in the Lord. See what God does. You know, and sometimes it's not just like, okay, Lord, I'm rejoicing in you and, and where's the peace? Sometimes you need to spend a little time there. Maybe sing a few songs, turn on some worship music. Get the word out. Read it. Say it. Lord, I'm going to rejoice in you. Even if you don't feel like it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, your, your word says rejoice in you always. I'm going to do it. But I feel like I'm not. Watch what God does. I, I'm just, you know why I'm saying this over and over? Because you need to try it. And I pray that these words haunt you the next time you're really going through something. That these words haunt you. Rejoice in the Lord always. That pastor told me that. Tell me God's word. Do it. Rather than complaining, griping, fuming, anxiety, rejoice in the Lord. You know, Habakkuk learned that lesson. You know, because things were going well for Israel. And he knew that God was going to allow the enemy to come in and be the discipline of the Lord for them. And they were going to be in trouble. It was not going to be good. And you know, in the end of the book, he was troubled. But at the end of the book, he said this, Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fall, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and He has made my feet like hinds feet, and makes me to walk on high places. And they were in for some troubled times. I don't know if you know it or not, but this world's in for some troubled times. We're in them. 
But you know, we aren't as affected as people in other countries yet. Miss Ann and I just went to the missions conference and you know, for five, four days, four whole days, we just got to sit there and worship the Lord and just be bathed in His Word as one teacher after another taught the Word. And it was such a special blessing for us this year because every teacher was a missionary, a pastor missionary somewhere for years and years. And some of them had been through some things. Some of them, it was live streamed. Some of them, they had to cut off the feed because they, they couldn't get out who they were because of the countries they were in. And it could cause them, to, them and the people they knew to get killed. And we were so encouraged in that conference. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, I'm just going to tell you, I could tell you a lot. I could be here all day. But I do want to tell you this. I was so encouraged. Miss Anna was so encouraged. And one of the things that really encouraged me was God is moving in this world. Who are you, Miss Pumps? God's moving, man. He's moving in, in Europe. He's moving in the Middle East. You know, some, there's, there's so many on fire Christians in the Middle East of countries that, that is, is their lives are on the line, on fire Christians there. God is moving. God is moving in Europe. God is moving in the United States. God is moving in Belize. God is moving on this peninsula. This God is moving in Sainbite. And you know what encouraged me the most? God is moving in Calvary Chapel, Sainbite. Right here in our little church. God is moving. And it just encouraged me to be reminded of that. What do I mean by moving? He's working. He's touching. He's changing lives. He's building up his body. He's building a team right here in this church, a team of us. What, what you know is really hitting me there. We're a team, man. And the enemy wants to rip you off. You've been going through things lately, getting discouraged, getting bummed out. It's because the enemy's trying to stop you from the team that he's building. But I'm really excited about what God's team. You know, he's got my focus back on that. Not that I was way out in left field, but just was so encouraged. God is moving. He's even moving in the United States. And hey, he's even moving in Canada. All over the world. Rejoice in the Lord always. You want something to rejoice about? There's something right there. God's moving. Guess what? God is moving in my heart. He's moving in my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you you don't give up on me. Thank you you don't let me hang there. You're working in my life. Guess what? He's working in your life. Right now, He's speaking to you. He's working in your life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Point number three. God's prescription for peace. Verse five. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Well, I want to share with you about this verse. This verse I can do the whole um, just a whole study on. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna touch it. But it, it is a just a wonderful verse. Verse 5 there. Be gentle, be kind, and be anxious for nothing. A peaceful spirit will be a gentle spirit. When you have peace in your life, you'll be kind. You'll be gentle. You know, Jesus was gentle. You know, gentle sounds like, doesn't sound like a manly kind of thing, you know. But it is. Be gentle to all men. Treat them with kindness. You know, people might not be able to see your heart, but they can see your kindness. They can see your gentleness. And then they'll see Jesus when you let him work through you like that. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 44. We know it very well. Jesus speaking says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Man. That's all. That could be a hard one. Until you understand that he can do that through you. It can be really hard. 
Because I don't want to pray for my enemies. I don't want to pray for those who put me down and tear, tear me apart. Well, well, let's put it this way. I didn't try to use correct English, but I'm not going to. I didn't used to. <laughs> but now, you know, the Lord's given me a heart, you know. I can, I can pray for them. I can pray for people that hate me or dislike me or, you know, they're anti-Christ or whatever. Because I know God loves them. And that's how you love your enemies. Maybe, you know, go ahead and take them out to lunch or something. I mean, you could. You know, I told you guys, we told the story of our neighbor in the States for tw over 20 years that hated my guts. And, you know, I had a, for all those years, every year, making cookies at the holidays, bringing them over to him, you know. And then finally, you know, one time, it, it was at, at, it, when uh, computers came out and he was an older guy and he got a computer, he couldn't get the thing running. And Miss Anna said, said to him, well, Jim will come over and help you. Get it going. He goes, oh, no, he won't. Not the way I treated him all these years. <laughs> he, it, I mean, he treated me bad. I, I, tr I really tried times, you know, be nice to him. Some, some, I did yell at him a few times, but, you know, in the flesh. I mean, this guy, I remember one time sitting in my yard, and he was in his yard, and there's just this little fence about that tall in between us, and he's right there and right here. And I go, this is ridiculous. We're, you know, and I kind of, I said to him, I said, I said I, you know, we're, we're, we're both like humans on the earth, and we're neighbors, and I mean, we could, you know, maybe say hi to each other, so, you know, because you really don't know me. And as soon as I said that, he said, I blanket don't want to know you. They don't want to know you. <laughs> didn't, I mean, you know, it didn't work. <laughs> but his computer had some problems. He said, no, he wouldn't come help me, and Anna told me, the minute I got home, man, I didn't think I took a shower after work. I can't remember if that was work days or pastor days. Not the pastor days, not work days. But I went over there and said, yeah, I hear you got, you know, you got some problems with your computer. He says, yeah, yeah, and, you know, I fixed it for him. And he loved us. <laughs> the neighbors, after, you know, within the next few months, our neighbors would come to us and said, what happened? He hates you. He thinks you two are the greatest people on the earth. You know, I, I pray that he went to heaven. And he passed away a couple years ago. Every year we'd go by there, if he was around, we'd see him, you know, stop by and say hi, we'd go back to our home. In, in the States for a couple weeks. We'd stop and see him. He wasn't around that year because he hopefully went to be with Jesus. But it was kindness. It was gentleness. It was loving my enemy. He was my enemy, man. He changed. Romans 12, 19 through 21. Never take your own revenge. Same bite. I know. I understand. Sometimes that's our culture, revenge. You do this to me, watch out what I do to you. And then you do that to them, and then watch out what you do back. The Bible, Jesus says, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul speaking, never take your own revenge. Be loved. Oh, isn't that great? Be loved. I love you. But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a cookie. No, I mean a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be <coughs> overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Heap coals on his head. There was years and years and years I thought, what does that mean? Like, heap coals on his head like, you going to burn him? You know what? What's that, what's that mean? And then I finally came to that place where I realized uh, it brings conviction to him. To that person, to your enemy, it makes it convicts them. It's like the little boy, the two little boys. You know, the one boy's this big, and the other boy's this big, and they're hanging out and they're playing together. You know, and they're up on this hill and they have this inner tube, and the and the big boy sits in the inner tube, and the little boy pushes him over the hill. Yeah, wolf, wham, bam. There's the big kid down there. Smoking, the smoke coming out. He is mad. He's gonna. He's taking a little kid and pound him a nail and put him right into the ground. So he comes up to the little kid. The little kid's like shaking. He's got his hands in his pocket. The little kid's look. The big kid's looking at me. The little kid goes like this. Takes a piece of candy and drops it in his mouth. Couldn't be mad with candy in the mouth. <laughs> Kindness makes it hard for them to be mad at you. I mean, they still well and they'll fight it, but it does something. Remember, the Lord is near. He will be with you. 
and you can ask him to help you handle it and to get through it. He hasn't dropped you. He's always with you. You know, one of the things that I, one of my top ten things in my life that, you know, kind of meant something to me, and, and this is one of them. There are no inconveniences, only opportunities to minister. Write down now and let that sink in your head. And then remember it when the, when the inconvenience comes up. Okay? There are no inconveniences, only opportunities to minister. And you know, I've seen that truth. Those inconveniences are opportunity to minister, although I sometimes don't like to take them. So just love, be kind. Okay, another, number four, God's prescription for peace. Verse six, again. Be anxious for nothing. Well, you know what? I missed five was let your gentle spirit be known to all men. And I did the whole study on that one. I mean, the last verse I did, forgot to read it to you. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about it. The prescription is for peace. Don't worry about things. Give them to the Lord. Pray about it. It's like American football. For those of you who know anything about American football, you know the quarterback... He's got the ball. He hands it off. And that's what it is. Those problems, those anxieties, those worries you like, you know? Be that quarterback and hand it off to Jesus, your running back. Take it, Lord, and let him have it. Give it to him. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So you cast all your, your worries on Him. All the stuff troubling you. And you give it to Him because He cares for you. He wants to help you. He's going to help you get through it. He'll walk with you. You know, be specific. Pastor Chuck Smith would say this. He would say, General requests get general answers. Specific requests get specific answers. Tell them exactly what you want. Tell them what you need. You know, I, I am back to football again. And I know that God isn't for one team or another team. But sometimes, you know, it's, you know, I'm anxious for my football team to win. I want them to win. And so, you know, uh, Ann and I were on the airplane flying back yesterday. And I know my team's going to start playing football while I'm on the airplane. And I say, Anna, pray with me. She's, she's thinking, well, we're going home. This is going to be deep. So, you know, I said, Lord Jesus, would you help the Vikings? Uh -huh. <laughs> he did. <laughs> yeah, and she goes, what are you praying for? <laughs> uh, he, said, he says he cares about everything I think about, so that's what I'm thinking about. But your will be done. No, man. <laughs> See, I confess before you got it. I don't do that very often. I just wanted him to win. I wanted him to win the Super Bowl this year. But you know what? It's over now. I don't have to think about it anymore. I'm free from that little lie, right? Hey, you know, sometimes you have to be careful with, with sports teams and things like that because they can't be an idol in your life. You know? Catch me wearing like Minnesota Biden socks, then you come and rebuke me, okay? Well, in church. <laughs> Outside of church is different. That's just me, okay? So, you know, you you the exercise and then and you pray about it with thanksgiving in your heart. Thank Him. Thank Him. Thank Him that He's going to answer that request and that prayer. Thank Him for it. Because He's there. And He will work it out for good. I'm so excited what you're going to do here, Lord. I don't know what's going on. It's not good, but you know what? I'm going to watch and see. You know, it's fun to do that. You know, it, sometimes the trials are so hard, it doesn't seem like fun. But, uh, like there's a huge trial in Miss Anna's like my life right now. And I'm really excited to see how God's going to, what he's going to do with it, how he's going to work it out. It's like, hey, you know, it's a big one. But I'm not really like I could be. Oh, no, you know. You know? But I'm not. And when we do these things that we just looked at, the outcome of that is peace. There'll be peace in your life. It says that in verse 7. It says, And the peace of God, 
which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace is the outcome. And you know what? And that's what we all want. Everybody. All the people out there searching. All the people in the world searching. You know what? They, they want peace. They want God's peace. They just don't know it. But when they find it, wow. This peace goes way beyond understanding. You just don't know. How, how, can, how can they be so how, how can they be so content and blessed? I'll never forget our good friend, lady that played keyboard with me in trucking on the worship team for like over 20 years. Maybe even longer, 25 years. Her husband passed away at a young age. He got killed on a motorcycle accident. He wasn't even 40, he was in his 30s. And he died. And at the funeral, people were weeping and sad and crying. She was comforting them. She was so full of God's peace. And you go, wow, how does that happen? The peace of God. Yeah, she was hurt. It was hard for her. That was her husband she loved. They had two wonderful children who are now are a blessing. Two worship leaders in two different churches. They they, they were kind of bo almost born in the stage with us. I mean, Mama brought them in their, in their little things. They're right on our stage at the church and they became worship leaders. Became, became what you hang out with, right? And they're good worship leaders. They love the world. Peace. The peace that goes beyond our understanding. There was a contest in Chicago one time. Make, it was painters making a painting of peace. You know, all kinds of people joined us, and all kinds of paintings came in. You know, just nice paintings, you know, palm tree all alone out on the island. Not with a black beer, but you know, just a nice palm tree. Man fishing on a pond, you know, a deer in a meadow, soft running water. And the one that won was this. It was a crashing waterfall. You ever seen a waterfall that's just crashing and just the water goes up 20 feet in the air after it hits? I mean, a crashing waterfall. And next to it was this limb coming out of the rocks and a bird sitting in the limb, on the limb. And there was a nest with three little baby birds peeking out at mama. That's peace. The waves crashing around, the water going up. And there's this little baby looking at mama. That's peace. It's a picture of peace. Psalm 63, 7. Or actually verse 6 through 8. It says, when I remember you on my bed, he's speaking to the Lord, I meditate on you in night watches. For you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. That's peace. Knowing those things about me. Our Lord. And Jesus, the same peace He gives to His disciples when He says in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You see, the peace that the world gives you is just temporary. Boom, and it's gone. But Jesus' peace is permanent just walking in that peace with Him. When you're in His hands, when you surrender your life to Him, you'll have that peace. When you know He's in control of everything, no matter what it is, that peace. So God's prescription for peace. Number one, strive for unity in the body. To get along with each other. Number two, rejoice in the Lord. Always and again, I say rejoice. Number three, be gentle, be kind, be nice. And number four, do not worry, but give thanksgiving. And Romans 15, 33 says this, Now the God of peace be with you all. Let's pray. Lord, it is a blessing. It's a blessing to know that you are with us always. It's a blessing to have your peace in the middle of this life. In the middle of the trials and the troubles, the things that happen that Lord, they just, just hurt sometimes. But Lord, we can have your peace. We can have your joy. 
beyond understanding. We didn't even know how it happens. But when we seek you, Lord, when we surrender to you, you give it to us. And we thank you so much for that. And I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning. <clears throat> Maybe some are going through some heavy things right now in their life. And I know, Lord, you just want to love on them. I pray, Lord, that they are able to open your heart, their hearts to you this morning. And just to surrender it all, Lord, and say, here it is, Lord, take it. I pass it on to you, Lord. Fill me, Lord, with your peace and your joy. Help me, Lord, to get through this. I know you will never leave me nor forsake me, Lord, that you'll always be with me. So help me, Lord. I pray that for my brothers and sisters that are going through things this morning. And I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't forget it. And when that thing does come up, Lord, we will come back to your promises. And we will always remember, Lord, that you love us, you care for us, and we can just give it to you. So thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing that song. We're going to do another one. We're going to do a Mike Ockhelm one. We're going to do a Rejoice in the Lord Always. So let's start off. Let's all sing it together. And then the men will sing it. And the ladies will do it the second time around. We'll break off into a, a round. Rejoice in the Lord Always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. Welcome to visitors. Thanks for coming today. Hang out, get to know somebody. God bless you guys. Welcome, Jesus.